So today what we want to do is uh, talk about interest rates. You remember uh, what we've done up to now is we've calculated interest rates. Here's how, well, you know, how to interpret, here's how to calculate an interest rate. But as I said before, what we want to do is we want to talk about why, why are interest rates whatever they are. And this is our next topic for discussion. Um, what we have, and I referred to it before as supply and demand, but there is a model known as the loanable funds model of interest rates. Loanable funds, another term for that is just credit. And so this is uh, a model of the credit market. And we're going to talk about a lot of detail, but basically what it comes down to is a supply and demand model. And we've seen supply and demand in other economics classes. There's always a quantity down here on the horizontal axis when we draw supply and demand, and there's always a price on the vertical axis, but here it's the quantity of credit, and then on the vertical axis it's the price of credit, which is the interest rate. And so that really, and I mean that's a very simple model, but it gets a job done and it accurately depicts what takes place in the credit markets. So anyway, that's going to be what we present. Um, if that's all there were to it, then we'd be done but there are a lot of details that go in that for us to understand it. First of all, let's talk about the demand for credit. The demand for credit is also refers to borrowing. Okay, people who demand credit, this is not demand like give it to me or else, that kind of a demand. This is a need for credit, a request for credit. Right? Okay, and the people who demand credit or need credit, those are borrowers. Okay, now, if we just said who borrows, the answer is pretty much everybody. And so that's not going to be an adequate way of attacking this. What we want to do when we talk about the demand for credit or borrowers is we want to talk about the groups that are net borrowers. If we say everybody borrows, well then, okay. That's not really what we want. We want to know who borrows more than they lend, who on balance borrows funds. Okay? I borrow, I lend. I put money in the bank, I have savings and so forth. I put money away for retirement. Those are funds that are supplied in credit markets. And I also borrow. Which group am I in? Am I a borrower, am I a lender? And the answer is, for me or for you or for anybody, your net position depends on which one of those you do more of. Are you borrowing more than you're lending or are you lending more than you're borrowing? Okay, well, once we get away from the individuals and just talk about groups, there are two groups that are net borrowers in the U.S. credit markets that borrow more than they lend. And the first group is businesses. And the second group is government. And so we want to talk about their behavior and how they demand credit. How they do, why they do, and so forth. What motivates them, what that relationship looks like. Let's first of all talk about businesses. Business demand for credit. Most all borrowing done by businesses is to finance an investment in capital goods and inventories. Okay, now when I use this term investment, here's what I don't mean. I don't mean it like the uh, man or woman on the street means that term investment. I do not mean buying stocks and bonds. When we talk about businesses investing in capital goods, what we mean is by these capital goods, these would be tools, equipment, uh, structures, software, 
and I'll say etc. Stuff that can be used to make other stuff. Okay, and inventories, sometimes businesses borrow to purchase inventories. And these inventories are either materials or finished goods. General Motors has inventories of materials. They may have some inventories of steel, for example. They may have inventories of tires on hand to put on cars. And then they also have some finished goods, some inventories of just cars sitting out here waiting to be sold. And I don't know about General Motors operations, but they, um, uh, any other business, may go out and borrow some money in order to finance these inventories, right? You don't just have a car sitting here and say, hey, that costs nothing. Somebody's got to pay for all the stuff that went into that car in order to produce it, in order for it to just sit there waiting to be sold. So anyway, so this is the motive why businesses would demand credit. Ever seen that formula before? This is a formula for present value. If you'll go back in your notes, and you don't actually have to do this because you'll probably remember, but what I told you is that when people invest, when they make investment decisions, this is the formula they use to evaluate those investments. And so if you were going to go out, let's say you're running some business, and you say, gosh, I'm thinking about buying, I don't know, I'm thinking about buying some kind of a tractor, a backhoe, or I'm thinking about buying a delivery truck, or I'm thinking about buying a dump truck, or I'm thinking about buying, you know, some piece of equipment. What you would have in mind is if I get that equipment, that will increase my future profits. I can go out and do more work now. I can charge for more work. And so there's future money that will come back from that tractor or whatever it is that you're thinking about buying. And the same thing would be true if you said, here's structures. If you say, oh, we're going to build a new warehouse out here, then, hey, now that we have a bigger warehouse, we can store more stuff, we can sell more stuff, profits go up. So there would be the future returns. But then what we'd have to do is reduce those future returns to present value, and we've got this formula. When do we get the future return? Obviously, I don't have the sigma sign up here, and that would be relevant in virtually every case where there would be a stream of future profits from this capital investment. But I just want to slim this discussion down as much as possible. So we've got these future profits from the capital good. The same thing would be true from the inventories. okay? And then we want to see, uh, does that future uh, profit, when we bring it back to present value, what's it worth? Okay, and we do that, and we can just make up some hypothetical number. Here's $100,000 is the future money that we're going to get from this $27,000 tractor or $84,000 tractor or whatever. We calculate, we do the division, present value, and maybe we come up with some number. Here's $100,000, we're reducing it back to present value, and let's say it's worth $75,000. And so now what we're thinking is this. I'm ready to go shopping for a tractor. I've done all my due diligence. I've done all my um, projections out here, what I can generate in the future. I've reduced those numbers to present value. A new tractor would be worth $75,000 a year, a new truck. So now we go and we start pricing these and we start getting some bids on them. <coughs> and so what will happen, maybe somebody says, hey, here's the price of the truck, price of, let's say, capital equipment, and they may give us a quote, and they say something like this, $70,000. And so now we say, hey, this is pretty good. This is the best price I can get on this equipment I've been looking at. I can buy that for $70,000. All those future profits, $100,000 that it generates in the future, I reduce that to present value, and those are worth $75,000. I'm going to do it. So we buy that capital equipment. We make the investment. Okay, now, what was the interest rate I used here? I didn't tell you. Okay, because this is a hypothetical example. Let's say it was, mm, I don't know, 6% hypothetically, and, and that all worked out. We buy the equipment. Now, what happens if interest rates rise in the marketplace? 
And when, now we can't borrow money at 6%. Now our reasonable uh, uh, discount rate's now 6%. Now it's 7%. And we go through, we've got the same $100,000 in the future, we calculate present value, and now it comes out to $68,500. Do we make that investment? Do we buy that piece of equipment? No. Why? Because I don't spend $70,000 to get back $68,500. That's a loser. And so what we have, let's draw a little bit of a graph here, what we have is something like this, business, investment in capital goods and inventory. I won't write all that out. And this is a dollar amount. There's an interest rate. And what we've got is a relationship that looks like this. And what that relationship says is at lower interest rates, there are more of these yes answers. Yes, I will buy that capital equipment. And when these discount rates go up, and we do the same calculation, then there are more of those investment opportunities where we say no, okay? And so in the first instance, and this was just one investment decision among not only what this one company faces, a company may, might be thinking, hey, should we get some new desks for the employees? Should we get some new computers? Should we get some new software? Should we build onto the side of this building? Should we get some tractors and delivery trucks and so forth? There are a wide range of investment decisions that a single company makes, and then throughout the economy, there are more and more of those. And so what happens is it doesn't go from 6% yes to 7% no for everybody at the same time. Even within one firm, some projects at that point become no's and others still are good investments. But the relationship is this. Every time that interest rate gets higher, in this formula we have present value goes down. This is this inverse relationship we talked about before. Every time interest rates go up, the present value of capital projects goes down, and we say no to more of those projects. And so higher interest rates are associated with less and less investment, and vice versa. During those times when interest rates are going down, present value of these projects is going up, and then there will be lower interest rates, more investment. And those periods when we have uh, we haven't gotten to it yet, but expansionary monetary policy, it's pushing interest rates down. Low interest rates, businesses are saying, hey, this would be a great time for us to add on to our factory. This would be a great time for us to get that new robot. This would be a great time for us to do whatever. And so, lower interest rates, more investment in capital goods. Okay. What we're interested in here is business borrowing. And so, some businesses pay for their investment in capital goods, pay for it out of their own cash flow, what they're generating out of their profits. Some companies will sell stock. Some companies will borrow the money. And we're not interested in the companies that do this through their cash flow. We're not interested in the companies that pay for these capital goods by selling stock. These are issues that come up in the, the field of corporate finance. How are we going to finance our business? Okay. But we are interested in those capital projects that are financed by borrowing. And so basically what we're saying is this, is the lower the interest rate, the more we will go out and borrow to finance capital projects. And also to hold inventories. Now, what inventories are we talking about? I gave a couple of broad examples here, but truthfully, you go around town, you go to a car dealership, most car dealerships are holding finished goods, cars, out there on the showroom, either on the showroom floor or out in the lot they have behind that with the high fence, they borrow the money to finance those inventories. If you go to a lot of drug stores or grocery stores or clothing stores, a lot of those borrow the money in order to buy the inventory, to set it out here and put it on display, then you buy that merchandise, and then they take the receipts from the sale and pay out the bank loan. And not all on the same day, but that's the idea. City Utilities that sells us this power to light up the room, they buy materials. City Utilities will buy coal. The train comes in, there might be a hundred cars of coal, and they dump that coal. And now City Utilities has an inventory of coal, and then they will burn that and turn that into power and sell it to us. We send our, uh, uh, a check in at the end of the month to pay the bill, 
and now City Utilities has the money coming in to pay off that bank loan. Okay, so this is just ordinary business and City Utilities, just to take as an example, will have a bigger sort of inventory of that material if they can borrow that money more cheaply. And when they have to pay more to borrow that money, if interest rates are 10 or 12 percent, they might have a much smaller inventory of that coal. Why? Well, because if that hill of coal out there costs them $10 million and they're paying 10 percent to borrow the money, a $10 million inventory of coal, 10 percent interest, we're paying a million dollars a year to have that coal piled up out there. If interest rate went down to 5 percent, it would only cost us half a million dollars a year to keep that inventory of coal out there. And so we'll have a bigger inventory. Same theories. Any questions about this? This is a demand curve. I'm going to put a D next to it. And I'll put a B next to that with its business demand for credit. Questions about this? Of demand for what? Um, not Just, it's the demand for credit by these two groups. The businesses are the first ones that we're talking about. But they, they are borrowing money for these purposes to invest in capital goods or and structures or uh, inventories by those, the, the first group we talked about, just businesses. Okay? Any questions about this? Any other questions? Okay, let's talk about the second group, government. Oh, people say so much about the government. Okay, government. Who makes decisions by government on borrowing money? And the answer is they don't do it that way. Here's what happens is, here's government spending. And then we subtract government tax collections. And then the borrowing is the difference. Right? I'm going to put a term up here that we'll discuss. So if we have a situation where, and we'll just pick out hypothetical numbers, let's say the government spends three trillion dollars. Nah, they could never do that. Yes, they could. Let's say government spends three trillion dollars and then collects in taxes two trillion dollars. And by the way, the government does have a little bit of revenue over and above taxes. Okay, there are some fees that are charged and so forth, but for the most part, taxes. We're talking about revenues coming in. But if the government spends $3 trillion, writes checks for it, and gives those checks to people or transfers it into their accounts and so forth, and collects $2 trillion, hey, there's a shortfall. How can you spend $3 trillion and only have two coming in? And the answer is borrow the difference. So $1 trillion is the budget deficit. This is kind of like if, let's say you're running the government and you wanted to go out and buy three trillion dollars of stuff and you only had two trillion coming in, then you get your credit card out and use the credit card for the other one trillion. That's a big credit card balance you'd be carrying. Now, a few notes about this. One of them is this budget deficit, all of these numbers that we're talking about here, three trillion, two trillion, one trillion, and so forth, these are annual. One year, 12 months. So when you hear somebody talk about the government's deficit, that's an annual figure. Okay? Now suppose you've got a credit card and you went out and borrowed a trillion dollars this year. And then you got your 
statement at the end of the year, would it just say $1 trillion and that's it? And the answer is, well, that would be what the balance was before the year started and another trillion, right? So if you had borrowed in the past, like several trillion dollars, and then this year another trillion, then the balance on that statement wouldn't be one trillion, the one year figure, it would be the amount accumulated over the years. And so what we have is a, another concept, the national debt, and that is accumulated deficits over all time. Oh, minus surpluses. We don't have a lot of those, but we don't want to forget about the theoretical possibility that there's a surplus. And so, when would these have started? A long time ago. There we go. That is the, um, that's the easy answer that will not get you through a test. A long time ago. What happened in 1789? That is when the United States was created. Right? Before that, there were the, uh, the colonies, the English colonies, and then those colonies became independent, not only of England, but of each other, and there was a confederation, just a bunch of really what would be independent nations, 13 of them, and they all threw in together, threw off the yoke of oppression, fought that out, war ended when? It started in 1776, right? When did that war end? Boy, this stuff is hard, isn't it? I mean, you, how long have you been living in the United States? Most of you. You know there's going to be a foreign student giving an answer to this, right? 1783, war was over. Okay, then what? 13 countries. Not counting Alaska and Hawaii. 13 independent, you know, New York and New Jersey and Virginia and Massachusetts and blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah was the last three. And then they went on there and said, okay, we got what we wanted. And then after a few years they said, boy, this is not so good. We could do better. And then they all got together and said, hey, you know what we ought to do? We ought to just like all of us get together in one big country. U.S. Constitution, 1789. So at that point, we had a going enterprise, 1789. That's when the Constitution was ratified. These 13 states got together, 13 countries got together and filled out this, uh, this Constitution, made it all up, sent it back to the individual states, individual states ratified it, and when they ratified it in 1789, then we had the United States. And at that point, the government said, okay, we're in business, let's get a credit card. And you know, they did not charge much on the credit card in those early years, and they also didn't collect much in taxes. Those numbers are pretty small back in the old days. And over the years, they've grown. So anyway, <coughs> today, the national debt is it's all the deficits, these are annual, I'll put that again, the annual deficits, and then the annual surpluses. Over the years, every year there's either a deficit or a surplus, it could be the exactly imbalance, exactly a zero there, but boy, that's hard to do, you know? If you had a budget that was balanced and somebody just said, here's a dollar, the budget's out of balance. So, uh, in terms of it being exactly balanced, that's not a realistic possibility. But anyway, every year a deficit or a surplus, and then the deficits are causing that credit card balance to go up, and the surpluses, that's when you're paying it off. And we haven't been paying off much lately for a long time. We paid off a little bit in um, mid to late 90s, not much. I think what we had was two years, I'm going to say, of paying off a little bit, a little bit of a surplus in the late 90s. 
Uh, President Clinton was in office then. Uh, we had wound down the Cold War. A lot of military spending was no longer occurring. This kind of makes me smile. Uh, and then public policy makers, the Congress, the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Treasury Department, some economists, you know what they were sitting around there saying, oh boy, what happens if we pay off all the debt? And they started like, getting worried about that. Anyway, that passed after like two years. And so anyway, then we went back to running deficits. Before that, and I don't know the exact date, but <clears throat> let's say 1998, just to put a number on it. I could look these numbers up, and so could you. Anyway, had a couple years of modest surpluses. Before that, you had to go back to 1969 to find a surplus. So we're talking about 30 years in between surpluses. And then, since then, we've been talking about deficits. And so now the national debt is ballpark figure 10, I'm going to put a plus trillion dollars. And very recently, the Congressional Budget Office, Congressional Budget Office is, it sounds like a budget office reporting to Congress. That's what it is. The Congressional Budget Office has a bunch of economists and accountants and different people working for them, staff members. And they made a forecast. And here's what they're, and nobody knows, but they said this, we forecast over the next 10 years that we're going to run deficits year after year after year, and those will accumulate, and not any surpluses, and those deficits over the next 10 years will be $9 trillion. And so if they are right, then you add another nine to this, and this will be uh, approaching $20 trillion when we all get back together for our 10-year reunion here in this room. I've already put in a reservation for it. Okay. So anyway, what I'm saying to you is, huh, if it took us 200 and, what would it be, 20 years, more or less, to run up $10 trillion worth of debt, and it's going to take us 10 years to run up, not quite, see the thing is, I'm really not optimistic, so I probably think this will be more than nine. But anyway, we're just about going to double this in a 10-year period. The good news is this, I am going to die and not pay a thing off on this, and I will leave that to you. Yes, sir. Oh, we know what the national debt is. That's accurate. This number is the one that's, you know, we won't know until after the fact how much debt accumulates because the thing is, this doesn't take into account what's going to happen with new laws being passed and things like that. But in terms of how much is the debt accumulated right now, yeah, pretty accurate. And you could get on your iPhone or whatever and find that out in just a minute. Did you, did you do that? 11.8. No, that couldn't be. Once you, here's the thing that's wrong with those numbers. I'm not saying it's not accurate as far as it goes. Some of that is government owing money to other government agencies. Some of that is government owing money to the Federal Reserve. And so then we start saying, hey, are, you know, is the Federal Reserve going to make us pay that back? That sort of thing. So anyway, 10, 12, I think it's not that high really in terms of the number that Congress worries about which is what we're coming back to here in a moment anyway. But anyway, so what we're going to do is add another $9 trillion worth of debt. My guess is more over the next decade. Wow. The good thing is, that's a record. Nobody's ever done that before. Not in the whole solar system. I mean, this is not just for the United States. This is a record for our solar system, but per and possibly for the galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy. They make good candy bars. Um, back to our story. What was our story? We want to understand this. Why is this one trillion or two trillion or whatever the numbers are going to be? Who makes the decision? Who makes a decision on how much government's going to spend? Because nobody makes a decision on the deficit. Okay? They make a decision how much to spend, they make a decision how much to collect in taxes, 
and then the deficit is the difference. Okay, so who makes these decisions? Anybody? Congress. Congress with presidential approval. And it's the same thing with taxes, right? Our tax laws are passed by Congress and the president signs it. I'll put this formula back up here for present value. Can you kind of see this? I mean, you can watch C-SPAN and see how this all works in action. Have you ever seen any of these people in Congress say, huh, what would be the present value of that highway? How much does it cost to build that highway? You know, I don't think that highway is going to produce enough future revenues or benefits to justify that, the present value of that highway, you know, its value as an asset is, let's say, $1 billion, it cost us $1.5 billion to make it, no. Do they do that? No. No, they don't do that. So, they don't really go about it, you know, here we had uh, businesses, they don't really go about it that way. How do they go about it? Like if you're in Congress and you're sitting on a committee, and maybe it's a committee that considers highways, what would your thinking be? Hey, we need a highway to come to this town that's in my district. I'm representing the whatever, the 48th uh, congressional district in Missouri. Missouri doesn't have 48 districts. I'm representing this district. We need better highways here. And somebody says, we need better highways than Iowa. And you say, no, you don't. All you've got in Iowa is corn. Corn doesn't drive. You don't need highways. Missouri, we need highways, right? And then the guy from Iowa, or gal, the member of Congress, says, hey, I am not going to go along with you having a highway if we don't get one. And then you say, okay, well, I'll go along with yours. You go along with mine. And so everybody gets a highway. And do they ever go, hey, the present value of that, mm, no, let's don't do it. You don't hear that term tossed around a lot. These are political decisions. Is that bad? No, that is not bad. If I were running for office from Missouri's 48th district and I gotta have votes and I'm on a committee that builds highways, I'm thinking, what am I gonna do to get reelected? Am I going to jump up and say, that is a total waste of money. You're not building a new highway through my district. Because you know what's going to happen if I say that? The person I run against in the next race is going to get a video of this, videotaped, and they're going to give it to all the TV news stations in town. And I'm going to be standing up there and saying present value. And I am going to lose the next race, right? So... This is not really the way the calculation's done. And there's another problem with this. What if those benefits, these high, let's say this highway is going to be built through here, or let's say that there's going to be a dam built or a bridge or anything like that. My time horizon is different than the time horizon of that project. I'm thinking about the next election, two years. If I'm in a Senate, it could be two years or four years or six years. But if I'm a president, four years or no time horizon because there's no more re-elections. But the time horizon of the decision maker in Congress tends to be whatever the political cycle tells them. And these projects don't have that same time horizon. And so there's kind of a mismatch. Now, what about that for businesses? If you're a business, the business has an infinite life. The people who buy buying stock in it, now I don't mean to say that the people who are running a business have infinite tenure in their jobs as a CEO or something like that, but the people who are buying stock in a business are thinking, hey, what's that company worth? 
And so then they are buying stock in a company that can generate profits this year, next year, two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now, here's a, a business. And so there is a way in the stock market for us to take all those future profits and bring them back to the present. And that's how much we are willing to pay for that share of stock. But there is not a way for all these future benefits of projects to be brought back to the present in the political world. And so it just ends up being done at the polls and the elections. And so then it's kind of like put a high priority on now. Yeah, I'm going to build a highway. It's going to cost a billion, or, uh, it's going to provide a billion dollars worth of benefits. It costs a billion and a half dollars, but you know what? That billion and a half dollars is going to be paid in the future. We're going to borrow the money and maybe borrow it on a 30 year bond. And then somebody else can worry about paying for it. It'll look like a free highway. We're going to borrow the money on our credit card. We'll pay it off in 30 years. And by 30 years from now, I'll be dead, the politician says. 30 years from now, I'll be out of office. I'm not going to worry about the cost. I'm going to worry about the benefit. So anyway, I don't mean to say there's something bad about these people in Congress, because that would be the position you or I would be in if we were running for Congress, too. Our incentives would be the same. We'd be in a bind. So anyway, when we start talking then about the analysis, it'll be something like this. The Congress will get together, and they'll negotiate with the President and so forth, but they'll get together and they say, we need this highway. We need that aircraft carrier. We need this new hospital, veterans hospital. We need to do this or that with Social Security. And they'll say what we need to do to spend money. At the state and local levels, they have their own needs. We need a new prison. We need a new... Uh, elementary school. We need to fix the potholes and the roads. But they'll go out and they say, we need these things. And they're being influenced by voters, by the public. And then they'll say, well, let's go out and borrow some, or uh, tax people up to the point where we can. And they've done all these things based not on economic calculations, but on some other basis. And then they come up with numbers. And then I've written down three trillion, two trillion. And so when we draw a graph of what that looks like, here's what? Uh, credit needed to finance the deficit. There's a demand for funds by government, and it is based on all of these political calculations. Political is not a dirty word, it's just not an economic calculation, it's different in nature. But this is the spending minus the taxes. And that's how much we need to borrow. Yeah, have you ever heard on C-SPAN or something like that, a congressman say, you know, interest rates are pretty high. Let's just don't build these highways. No. I've never heard it. I've paid a lot of attention over the years to C-SPAN. And I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm saying they don't consider things that way because they have different things that influence their behavior. So they don't take a business approach. They're not supposed to. If it were business, we'd have businesses run the government, and we don't. So I mean, we intentionally take certain things, activities, out of the business world and hand it over to government. So we shouldn't, I'm not trying to evaluate them like this is a lousy business you're running. I'm just saying it's not run like a business. Okay, so anyway. Now, here's what we do. We've got two demand curves that we've talked about. I'll put the other one right here. Here's the quantity of borrowing by businesses. And we had this demand curve, DB. And so what we want to do is add these up. How do you add two curves together? It's like this. Watch. Put a plus sign in the middle. <laughs> What'd you think? That's the add sign. Equal, of course. Let me draw another graph over here. In theory, what we would do is we'd have the bottom axis, the horizontal axis, lined up all the way across here. Interest rate, quantity of credit.
And then we would just pick some interest rate, like let's say 3%, and put a horizontal line across here. And we've got the government borrowing a certain amount. Let's just put a number down here. It doesn't make any difference how much it is. $50. And we've got businesses borrowing a certain amount. Let's say $300. And then what we would do is say, hey, three, a 50 plus 300 is, unless I'm mistaken, 350. And that's when the interest rate's 3%. We've got a dot. Well, then I guess it's time to do that again. Let's say the interest rate's 6%. Dot, 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 horizontal line all the way across. We're going to add along that horizontal line. Hey, we've got still $50 billion, or $50, I should say, by government. The business sector now, 200. So 50 and 200 is. These are just too easy, aren't they? 250. Now, in theory, we do this at every possible interest rate. 3.1%, 3.2%, 3.3%. And so then we would just generate a whole series of dots over here. And that whole series of dots would trace out a curve. <laughs> My hand slipped. Would trace out a curve. That's a downward sloping curve. And it would go through these dots that we made. And this is the total demand for credit. This process is called horizontal summation. Horizontal summation of the curves. Questions? On the other side of the market, we have three groups. I said we were going to talk about the sectors, the groups that are net borrowers. On the supply side of the market, we have the lenders. There are three groups that are net lenders that lend more than they borrow. The first group, households. People. Most of the households that are comprised of students borrow a lot more than they lend. And so most of the student households will be on the other side of the market. But when we take all households together, we've got a lot of people who have their life savings People who are retirees have their life savings, and they got mo most of them have their houses paid off. We put all households together, households are net lenders to the extent of trillions of dollars. A second group of lenders, banks and the Federal Reserve. And we'll talk about how, but they are working together in this process that we will discuss. And the third group of lenders that we'll consider are foreign lenders. People overseas save money, and they want to loan that money out to somebody to get interest. And they loan a lot of it to people just down the street from where they live, but some of their savings works their way to the United States. Okay. What we're going to do is have a curve that is associated with each one of those groups of savers. We will add those three curves together, and we'll get a total supply curve, and that will be next time. So long.